want to uh, again thank everybody for uh, joining us, in particular our guests tonight, uh, Zach, Andrew, and Jan, uh, coming from a, uh, a darker time zone than we are in right now. So in, in on the East Coast, so thank you for staying awake for this. Uh, hopefully you'll 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 be still energized at the end of it. Um, just as a kind of quick note, again, I want to I want to push the audience here um, to really use the uh, Q and A. Uh, um, type those questions in, and we'll try to moderate as best as possible. And again, there's also the virtual space for for you guys to venture to uh, in terms of the Miro board, uh, so you guys can check out some information that's being loaded up for you uh, from past um, present presentations and also what's going on here in South Florida. Um, okay, so I'm gonna begin introducing here, and we can get started. So our first uh, speaker tonight, uh, Zach, Zach Malka, it also maybe one of the coolest titles. I don't know um, if we have a better title in the, in the presentations yet, but Zach is the warden of the AA's Hook Park campus. He's also lead tutor to the Master of Architecture Design Plus Make program and the director of the AA Wood Lab dedicated to demonstrating the potentials of trees. Uh, the work at Hook Park has been published uh, and pushing the uh, traditional understanding of uh, working with wood uh, using three-dimensional scanning of trees and uh, generative modeling and also robotic uh, fabrication processes. Uh, the projects uh, created on Hook Park campus have been widely discussed and uh, show up in a, a multitude of platforms that uh, push the, uh, uh, the work of Hook Park out of the woods and into uh, the desks and, and spaces of, of, of the rest of us here. Um, they are, challenging some really interesting notions within, within uh, architecture and, and wood processes. Uh, so Zach holds a degree from Dalhousie uh, School of Architecture in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he's uh, coming to us uh, from the Hook Park uh, campus. Uh, Andrew Freer uh, is the professor of School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape Architecture, and the director of the Rural Studio at Auburn University. Uh, Andrew holds the degrees from University of Westminster, and Architecture Association and has been honored with the Global Awards for Sustainable Architecture, American Academy of Arts and Letters. He's been a Harvard Bill Fellow and a President's Medal for the Architecture League of New York. However, most um, and potentially the, the uh, most notable thing here uh, is through all the achievements, awards, publications, recognitions, and notoriety bestowed upon the Rural Studio. And this is for better or for worse um, in terms of all that stuff. Um, uh, been nothing short of admirable to watch Andrew remain focused on a very straightforward task with his work there uh, in Alabama, which is to question the conventional education and the role of the architect while serving the new, uh, newborn community. That's quite stellar to see this program grow and evolve over time. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have uh, Jan Nippers. So Jan Nippers uh, is a practice manager of Nipper Helbig, uh, Advanced Engineering and head of the Institute for Building Structure and Structural Design, ITKE, uh, at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. Uh, from 2014 through 2019, John was the coordinator uh, of the DFG Collaborative Research Center, uh, Biological Design and Integrative Structures. And now he's taken on the role of Deputy Exec Executive Director of the Cluster of Excellence, uh, Integrative Computational Design and Construction for Architecture. John has authored multiple publications, including Biometrics uh, for Architecture, and is the co-author with Akim Menges on a recently released publication, Architecture Research Building, looking at 10 years of shared research between the ICD and ITKE. Uh, all, everybody in this panel has been uh, widely recognized as a leader in the uh, academy role and, and, and beyond. So we, we gotta really thank them for taking the time out here to come visit with us. I will uh, position a little bit of a prompt here um, for this particular tract. So how did we get here? Uh, where did we come from? And where is it that we think we're going? Rainier's Bantam commentary on material use, the structural solution or the power operative solution. Projected architecture would remain in a cyclical allegiance to traditions. An ideal tribe, as he states here uh, in, his, in his publication, rationalists would consider the amount of wood available, make an estimate of the uh, probable weather for the night, wet, windy, or cold, and dispose of the timber resources accordingly. A real tribe being inheritors of ancestral cultural predisposition would do nothing of the sort, of course, and would either make fire, build shelter, according to precise discussions. And that, as will emerge from this study, is what Western civilization uh, still do in most cases today. This is from Rainier Bantam's The Architecture of a Well-Tempered Environment. 
The goal of this track is to uncover the novel and innovative methods and techniques designers are thinking through and constructing with mass timber and solid wood assemblies. And at the behest of Renair Bantam, we must address how we are disposing of our timber resources. And with that, turn it over to our panel. Great. Well, thank you, Chris, for having us today. It's really a pleasure to join just getting my screen set up. Um, and where will I put that? Yeah, well, I'm pleased to join today's session uh, and share some of the work and the wood buildings that have been created in the English forest that I've come to call home. I'm here really with, with two hats on. Uh, I'll be showing some work that I led the development of as a student in 2015. Five years later, I'm stuck in the woods and have had the privilege really to take over operations of this site. Um, I really want to emphasize that the work here depends on the efforts of a ton of people um, and want to recognize in particular Martin Self, the director of the Design and Make program for setting off a research trajectory that really pulled me across the ocean and has since become a bit of a personal obsession. In 2015, we designed and fabricated the Tree Fork Truss a 25 meter arching structure made up of tree forks taken from local beech trees. I'm gonna dive straight into this pivotal project in detail and then tell the story both of what came before and some of where we've headed since. Exploiting advanced digital technologies which have become increasingly available, this project seeks to exploit the inherent forms of trees with minimal processing. It critiques the fact that we've become so accustomed to materials of unlimited plasticity that as we reapproach wood, we can't help but to demand the same performance of it. Each wood product seeming bent on overcoming the tree's peculiarities. We propose work which pushes and also embraces material limitations. It is work that's rooted in tradition. The drawing on the left shows compass timbers sought centuries ago by wood builders. Um, these complex forms were not simply used, but in fact sought after, recognizing the value of complex grain if it was used properly. And so in this project, quite simply, the question became what to do with forks. This thinking was further shaped by the installation of the A's first robotic arm. In wanting to design with forks, it became essential to know them well. And so we approached the forest with our iPhones in hand, standing trees becoming an available database of forms that might be deployed. We spent weeks and weeks and weeks using our fingers, sketching on paper and modeling with small twigs until after many iterations, a structural truss began to take shape. This shape was tested simultaneously through digital workflows on the left, the first parametric model and on the right, a one to 20 model, which quite entertainingly was the largest scale this structure was tested at before going for the full thing. Design complete. In this site, we have the unique ability to work with our school's forester to begin selectively harvesting from the beach compartments surrounding us. And extracting forks, we were then able to rely on machinery, taking forks over length at nearly five meters long, my colleague saw hill here for scale um, and weighing up to half a ton. To work with these forks in 3D design tools, we precisely 3D scan each using photogrammetry and then develop our own workflows for being able to organize these digitally. So in this capacity, you're seeing a script which would have been shuffling around forks to ask which wanted to be where based on its very specific geometry. From here, each fork is brought to the robotic arm where it would undergo very precise operations, three or four cuts and nothing more. On the right, a really important image for me, um, most of what we do is projects that don't really have a logical instruction set. And so in this case, we show a project which has been assembled entirely from a Rhino workspace without a single drawing printed out. This video charts three weeks and not a whole lot of sleep during which the second half of this truss was assembled. Each piece cut by the robotic arm, its assembly working with green timber depends on sledgehammers, ratchet straps, and a whole lot of mechanical force and fixing more than a click together assembly. For us, this isn't a bad thing and we would really challenge the need to do more. 
craning in three and a half tons is a unique opportunity as students. And I must say it was a day well beyond what I ever really expected. And finally assembled on site, the structure spans 25 meters from front to back, reaching a height of eight meters at its peak and 10 meters wide in its front. The last image I'll show of the project is one crafted from a LIDAR scan of the structure, which taken after its completion has allowed us to measure the structure's accuracy and shows somewhere in the range of about a 50 mil accuracy across 25 meters of the building's length. The setting for this work and what has become my home for the past six years is Hook Park, the Architectural Association's second home lost in the forest. Hook Park is a 350 acre working forest in Southwest England. It's surrounded by an idyllic rural landscape and is an easy place to get lost in. At the forest center is a growing educational campus composed currently of 12 experimental wood buildings with new smaller structures appearing throughout the days. I'm joined in Hook by a diverse team that includes craftspeople, designers, engineers, roboticists, a forester, and more, each an expert in something. The best of the projects made here happen somewhere in the space between us all. Hook is the site of an ancient woodland first recorded in 1086. Many things, as is common in this country, have happened here since, but I'm going to take a pretty particular point of that history for most of today's talk. I'm going to present one particular version of the story of Hook Park that the AA's Wood Lab Research Fellows are now working with me to write a long overdue book on. Since 85, Hook Park has been host to a line of projects which challenge the way that we build with trees. 30 years earlier, though, the stage was set for the story. Through the early 1950s, Hook Park was thoroughly clear felled along with forests across the UK in response to post-war shortages of building material. In the following years, the site was rapidly replanted based on a strict compartment model. Hook then offers an interesting condition. It's the grounds of an ancient woodland and yet few of its stems began life before 1950. Many species are present, which provides a rich material library, but most are dominated by a single species and age class. These projects really start from, in my mind, a simple observation. The shape of the wood buildings we erect have a consequential impact on the forestry practices of the world and therefore on the forms of trees. Our question really is whether we can both increase the use of wood in building while working to restore a new kind of natural condition. The work of artist Giuseppe Pannone provides for me a visceral reminder of how simplistic our use of trees remains. Pannone states, the tree is a living being that fossilized its form, its life in its form, and that every part, every lead, every single branch of it is necessarily linked to its survival, to its life. In 1982, a local furniture college led by John Makepeace made the fortuitous decision to acquire a forest, the forest we've moved into. Here they set up the School for Woodland Industries, educating students on design, economy, ecology, and more. The fundamental observation was that a key reason for undermanagement of the country's forests was a lack of value in the production chain. In 1983, an early master plan shows some of the exciting buildings they had in mind, an energy center, a campus, a place for learning, a place for staying, a new space to teach within. This work was developed by ABK Architects in the early days. Integral to every project that I'll show has been the collaboration of many professions. A key and enduring collaboration has existed between architects, engineers, foresters, and craftspeople that underpins every single project that we'll look at. First moves on the site were made by artist Andy Goldsworthy on the left here, who constructed a front gate from bent poles found in the wood. To begin building the school, an incredible team was put together, which would include Fry Otto, Ted Happold, Richard Burton, and teams across a number of universities who would support the material testing. The brief provided for the teams of the first build was to work with low value forest products, things taken from the woodland, and to increase the value of these materials through their skill in design, rather than through stages of energy intensive processing. The design method would start from the forest and saw as a first step the foresters tell the designers what was available. 
For the first projects, this was small diameter round wood thinnings and a familiar face for some in the photograph. From here, the engineers were then tasked with telling the group what could be done with this material. And in this case, the key observation was there was slender poles, they must be used axially along their grain and avoiding bending. With this in mind, for the first structure, a tensile roof was imagined, timbers converted into poles or into cables really, and on the right, an image of the connections that were developed. The project's lead contractor describes the project every time I talk to him as high tech in design and low tech in its construction. This is a spirit we try our best to keep active. Having provided the potential or proved the potential to make buildings from this material, the same team would go much bigger a few years later and built our main workshop, the building that I'm sitting in now. Spanning 15 meters across, in the case of the workshop, the engineers would dictate a compression structure and develop this with the architects. From this, the architects developed the building system and the whole team set about construction on site. A truly unique construction, this building saw around 100 trees strapped to a concrete slab and slowly, incrementally, and I imagine losing a few of those trees, bent down to create the arch that's over top of me here. Two trees meeting in the middle of a point. I must say we get to spend most of our time in this building and that's quite a privilege. In 2002, the AA had the good fortune to take on Hook Park. And from day one, the fundamentals in my mind were covered. We had a place to eat, we had a place to work and a place to sleep in. And so really everything since then has been bonus. It's been about increasing the capacity, pushing the research and further developing it as a unique educational site. Through the first number of years, this really just meant moving into somebody else's digs. And so here you see AA students starting to build some large scale pavilions that would leave the woods. We've been particularly lucky to have two key members of staff remain, us, remain with us on site to this day, our workshop manager, Charlie and Forrester Chris. In 2010, Martin Self would found the design and make program. Arriving with a mixed background, including aerospace engineering, geometry design and architectural theory, he revived and progressed the approach we take building on the history of the site's buildings. We're not always certain what it means, but we like to say that we explore design at the point of physical production. I like to think that this at least gives a hint of design. In 2012, the program would complete its first project, still its biggest, the Big Shed. Returning to roundwood poles, but looking to a more mature forest grown 20 years since, the students developed ways to fabricate irregular roundwood trusses, which minimize the use of steel connections. They don't avoid it entirely, but they started a trajectory which we've sought to continue, which is at the bare minimum to use found steel components and avoid the manufactured if we can. The building has become since the mothership of the site, a building that births other buildings, and many of the photos will be shown in this space. Two years later, students identified a, another low value material in the forest, many acres of beech, which had been planted in the 50s with a high quality furniture industry in mind, but commonly became used as firewood in recent years. Beach has few uses in building, and so the building sought to look back to steam bending techniques developed first in furniture making. Instead of producing 100 of the same components as would typically be done, the students worked with our workshop manager to develop a variable bending jig capable of producing hundreds of components of each a different shape without disposable and quite wasteful formworks and in the end produce a spanning hexagonal lattice that has since been covered and shelters our timber while it sort of dries. In 2013, a group of students, I like to think inspired by Goldsworthy would remind us all that trees already happen to be bent in some cases. And so as a result, these trees also of low value might be used directly. In this case, Sada and Ingza, are out in the woods with a 3D scanner and 3D scanned around 200 standing trees. 
the inherent differences between each piece were aligned programmatically to create the boiler house's flowing wall. And this project, I must say, was underway when I arrived as a student. It becomes the starting point for the trajectory that the wood chip barn has then really built. Following the chip barn's completion, here we are in it, there's been a shift in our work towards smaller scale projects. This has also included the addition of an MSC strand launched in 2016. Building on the field opened up by these projects, we've been able at this smaller scale to investigate in far more detail moments within, and I wanna show just a few of those. Lucas Wilson, an early MSC student, would transform the barn into a gallery for this project, an ash tree. Asking the question of how much of a tree is used for what, Lucas went about the laborious process of unearthing a tree, pulling it out of the ground with our team and 3D scanning it in detail to get a sense for what was growing underneath. Borrowing on notions of tipped tail taken out of the food industry, MSC student Pat Birch developed a dissertation ground to crown where he built this spanning bridge. Working at a smaller scale, Pat questioned thoroughly the need for digital fabrication tools and so proceeded with conventional tooling to construct this bridge. I'd like to think he achieved a pretty good fit. In 2019, our students made another building with forks, rerouting trees to the ground and explicitly sought to merge organic and milled geometries. A playful drawing from our student Wyatt sought to understand the forces acting on these elements while still standing and look to use these as analogies for how they might be used in building forms. The addition of a 10 horsepower chainsaw has been quite a good addition for our production speeds. In these projects, I'd like to emphasize the fact that digital software and tools are employed in order to control and to harness complex forms rather than to create them. And this animation from Wyatt hopefully shows that point, a fully defined digital project capable of scaling and adjusting to different tree forms. The last project I'll show is from Seb Birch, who through 2020, with us through COVID, turned his eyes towards industry. And with Crown Timber in mind, he asked a question. What could a new kind of timber product designed to make better use of available resources and to enable more sustainable forest ecologies look like? The answer was the DTB. Working with small diameter beech and ash, Seb went on to develop his own kind of engineered product the densely packed timber block. A key aspect of the work to come, I feel, is to turn our eyes to the scale of the forest and also to the world's forests. This quick slide from a project being developed by a robotics developer and head forester gives a hint of where we're headed and shows species recognition based on drone flights over the woods. Generously funded by John Makepeace, who had founded the Hook Park campus in the 80s, through 2020, we've launched the AA Wood Lab, a new research arm dedicated to demonstrating the potential of trees. This year, our research fellows have set out to tell the story I've just shown in a longer form, in an overdue book. In addition to writing, the lab has been using 3D scans of these buildings to unpick their history, see what's happened during their life. Since 1980, Hook has been a forest to conceive and make a better future in, somewhere between science fiction and summer camp. While no one project will achieve what we are after, each continues to build the case for architecture whose production is in direct support of more resilient forests. I wanna end on a few words on this work from architectural critic, Jonathan Meads, which was taken from a film shot in this workshop the year I was born. This is what happens when the possibilities of materials are grasped by minds that are not in straight jackets. It cuts out the middlemen, the component fabricators, the packagers of bits, the purveyors of right angles who shaped the world because they supply its basic geometry. With a bit of luck, it'll encourage countless legions of others to bend the rules. And then this building will no longer be unusual. Thanks very much.
I might need to unmute Andrew. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, Zach. A bit intimidating following you, following you, pal. After that, um, so um, uh, good afternoon. It, it, it is a, a pleasure to be here. I'm presenting today from a, a small town of 185 people in West Alabama, where I run a design-build architecture program for Auburn University. It's home to about 30 students a year, third and fifth year undergraduate, and a small new uh, graduate research cohort. All the products you'll see today, all the projects you'll see today are designed and built by 18 to 25 year olds. And today I'm going to indulge in a quick survey of our explorations and hopefully illustrate our attitude towards timber and show how we're going forward. We live and work in a forest, the breadbasket of US timber production. Most of the land around us is forested and it's a very diverse forest as you can see. The management of these forests impacts our lives every day, as does the ownership. The fact that much of this land is owned by folks and companies not from Alabama, who also have very strong lobbying powers, keeps real estate taxes predictably very low, and that has consequences when we try to raise those same taxes for education. So it's a vicious circle, and our region remains fundamentally a poverty-ridden extraction landscape where much is taken and little given back. But wood is central to our lives, our curriculum, and our culture. Our headquarters building and all the buildings we inhabit are wood. We learn from them by living with them every day. Collective memory is also very important. We're proud to inhabit buildings others might tear down. We see them as a resource. Case in point is our design studio, the Red Barn, in downtown Newburn. Has a lot of character and very clear environmental controls. In winter, you put your clothes on, and in summer, you take them off, right? So built under dubious circumstances 150 years ago in the wealthy times of cotton and off the back of slavery, just what do we learn from these timber buildings and just how have they survived so long? We admire the pre-air conditioning environmental strategies, the generous porches, high ceilings, transom windows, narrow plans, cross ventilation, steep sloping roofs and the fact that the structures are lifted off the ground. Characteristics, all of which have con contributed to their longevity. They're buildings that breathe or at the, at the very least dry out when they get wet. We ask our students to study these antebellum homes and the utilitarian farm vernacular that surrounds and services them. The stunning barn was built on a plantation with clear evidence of the African carpenters who built it. One of the results of the study each semester are watercolour drawings that help the students look hard at the buildings, not just at the details, but how the material has aged. In our wood shop, we ask students to feel the material, work it by hand, smell it on their clothes, understand its fragility, strength and beauty. We're not Luddites rejecting technology, but we're careful to use tools we can maintain ourselves. Three hours from the university, a big city and an airport, CNC and digital technology has not really found its way here yet. In the workshop, tools have been collected over 25 years. To learn about wood, we asked the students to build a chair. The design challenge is to design and understand the process of building a piece of furniture by a well-known designer. They have to suggest and document the construction process. They're expected to make lots of mock-ups and jigs. And given time and space, they produce objects of remarkable quality in 16 weeks, often, often never having previously lifted a tool in anger. On top of this, our younger students get to round off their timber immersion by designing and building a small wooden house and learning the fundamentals of platform framing, either in a client house like this one, a home for Rosalie Turner, where we scavenge and handmade most of it, or they get experience in the 20K home project, where over the years we've been designing prototypical small homes that are, not, that are now starting to be rolled out across and uh, now just to be starting to be rolled out, tested by community partners and builders across the Southeast. They again are all simple stick frame houses, but they're also to provoke a cottage industry for building rural homes, homes built in the community, by the community, for the community. The desire being that all the materials are sourced from local building supply stores so that the money stays in the local economy and creates jobs. 
since, uh, since the late 90s, our older, older students working in small teams have used timber in various ways in a lot of our public buildings. This was the first public building for 110 years in Newburn, a new firehouse, built much to the chagrin of one of our beloved donors who couldn't believe we actually built a fire station out of wood. It was also built using a bypass trust system, a system that we find pretty forgiving and democratic for our students to use. We replicated all of the trusses with a single large jig. The building was clad internally with timber that had sat drying in our mayor's barn for 30 years. In charge of our own maintenance and facilities, four students were charged with designing and building a new fabrication pavilion for Raw Studio. It also used bypass columns and bypass trusses hung from the top cords, finished on the underside with rough cut cypress. We also do a lot of stick frame projects for our public buildings. This is a boys and girls club that used donated OSB and sticks. It's the biggest building we've ever done, half the length of a football field. Built by four students who helped the community raise over $170,000 in materials, the team built themselves a movable jig to help define the ridge line and build the ridge beam. The team also familiarized themselves with the NDS nailing requirements and figured out composite beams of OSB and sticks for the large spans. So we could build them ourselves and didn't have to bring in cranes or buy glue lamb or steel for the openings. Speaking of steel, for a few years, we went on a lamella adventure. We were challenged by local farmers to come up with a long span structure that didn't use steel. Lamella, a kind of skewed arch, uses prefabricated pieces of off the shelf two bys that we bolted together. To do this, we needed to build a jig to build on. Here, the jig trolley sits on the Brassima grade beam at the ground on wheels. The jig itself sits on hydraulics that you lift up to build a lamella. So the process goes like this. You lift the jig up on the, on the hydraulics, build a lamella section, lower the jig when it's complete, and then move the jig along, lift it up again and repeat. Honestly, we could have kept building until we got to Mississippi. When finished, thought, folks thought it was an art gallery, not an animal shelter, with naturally lit and ventilated cages for cats and dogs. The jig was so expensive, I told the next team that were doing a boys and girls club that they needed to use the jig again if we were gonna do the building. So they used the jig for the outdoor recreation roof and raised one side so that the stick frame clubhouse space could peek underneath it. It's a very small world and ironic that I follow Zach today. In, in 2007, 2008, I was invited to visit and teach at Up Park and spent a couple of years there helping with the strategic plan for the design make program. I came, to, I came back to Rural Studios super juiced at the idea of working with thinnings from the forest and the opportunity to wood bend wood having seen Fry Otto and Richard Burton's beautiful structures in Hook Park. Anyway, once back in Alabama, I had Richard Harris, the great wood engineer from Burrow Hackle and Bath University come and do some grid shell experiments. Sadly, he burst my bubble. All, all we proved was that our fast growing southern yellow pine was really too knotty and had too many imperfections for us to be very ambitious with bending. Basically, it just broke under any severe bending stress, unlike the, the longer growing, clearer northern European woods. Unabashed, we established a relationship with the US Forestry Service in the Talladega National Forest, directly with a local district ranger. She had the vision to replace out all the structures in one of the parks using thinnings from the forest. She wanted pavilions, bathrooms and walking bridges. It was a dream project, frankly. After the bad news with the grid shells, the first project we did was for an entrance pavilion for the park. We called it a tea house and we made shallow trusses with a simple tensioned wire bottom cord. Wanting to touch the wood as little as possible because thinnings have such little value, we struggled in the project with moment connections. That led us on a detour when Rural Studio was asked to make an exhibit installation at the VNA in London. Wanting to pursue thinnings for the exhibit, but also exploring how to do cheap and fast moment connections. We came up with a project called the Woodshed for jazz musicians to reverse, rehearse under or do some woodshedding as it's known in their business. The shed was made of a series of charred bents using thinnings 
all fastened together with continuous threaded rods and dowel moment connections. I guess this was really our first mass timber project and much to our delight, it actually had an afterlife and became a shed in the backyard of idiosyncratic English architect Roger Zagolovich's home in Dorset. Anyway, back to Alabama and our brilliant district ranger. Next project she wanted was a 180 foot long bridge to connect a walking trail, no small ambitions. By this time we had decided the best way for us to work with thinnings was to use lattice trusses with plenty of built in redundancy and simple dowel connections. The 180 foot long grid was to, bridge was to be made of three 60 foot long Toblerone sections. It attached to the bank of the lake and spanned out to intermediary pontoons with a built-in walking trail, walking surface. We had plans to float the sections into, into place. We built a substantial one-to-one -one mock up and her boss showed up and sadly said, no, you can't do this. She then asked us to design a complex of three restrooms and two showers for the campground and raise the facilities into the tree canopy. We achieved this with lattice truss towers for the facilities and trusses for the walkway that connected them together and stabilized them. She, asked, she, she also asked to increase, she was asked to increase visitorship and rebuild her facilities and claim, came with a clear plan to do that. The restrooms we offered to build for free and take down if they failed. Sadly, again, her boss said no. Our district ranger was way ahead of her time and of her bosses. It didn't end well for our friend. And it was very sad for the US Forestry Service because she was a really brilliant visionary and such a missed opportunity. The last thinnings project was a rather less glamorous use of thinnings than our first three attempts. We used them as ballast or what we call saddlebags to hold down and tension a scout hut structure. The scouts wanted rustic, so we gave them rustic. Excuse me a second, I'm drying up. In 2011, we had our first real venture into using monomaterial timber walls. Uh, Newburn, fire, Newburn Town Hall was a response to the firehouse. Architecturally, it had to compete with the big shoulders of its big brother. So we bookended the firehouse and made a downtown civic center space and courtyard. We chose to build a town hall out of locally sourced eight by eight cypress logs and the students dressed and, and the students dressed the logs. Because of the single material, the building has gravitas, visual weight and honesty. Everyone knows how it's built, stacked like Lincoln logs and everyone can tell what it's made of and where it's from. The big walls are held together vertically with threaded rod, which we have to tighten every year, and locally with a plywood spline and elastomeric baskets. The biggest challenge was recognizing that the 11 foot tall wall may shrink by up to four inches in the vertical dimension. So we mounted the windows like jewelry boxes on the outside and the doors on the inside with simple face bolted slot connections. The added advantage then, of course, that you can see the full thickness of the eight inch wall at all openings to celebrate the wood thickness. Built 11 years ago, the building is always remarkably temperate. And we started to surmise that the building was, that the timber was working as a thermal mass. Five years ago, in the midst of developing the 20K home product line, we started to do post-occupancy testing on our houses. We previously had a huge catalog of projects but only anecdotal evidence, no real data. And when we built this house for Bobby so tight that his wife got sick, we were annoyed at suggestions that instead of Bobby just cracking the bathroom window like anybody else would do, we were advised that we should use mechanical ventilation to help the building breathe. Now for me, especially living in a humid climate where the sole reliance on and potential failure of mechanical systems can be a disaster. This seemed just plain silly. And I was frustrated at the number of layers we were starting to install on our small houses, all with unknown sources and each solving a singular problem. The mantra seemed to be, just add another layer or let's go around the house yet again. And that seemed to be driven by big business and perhaps our own guilt that somehow we weren't quite achieving or doing enough. We like the term layer cake or cluster duct. 
which as you can imagine, there is a rude version of. Anyway, long story short, I bumped into three brilliant minds, Salman Craig and Keel Moe, who spoke yesterday, and David Kennedy, all were frustrated at the layer cake, cl at the layer cake cluster F. So over a few pubs blue ribbons, we decided that McGill University and Auburn Rural Studio should play together. Keel wanted us to look more closely at the embodied energy and carbon footprints in our projects. David brought expertise in mass timber and Sal with a background in building physics and biomimetrics suggested a bunch of tabletop monomaterial ventilation experiments that he wanted to scale up. I thought they would be an ideal dialogue and a science-based counterpoint to our current practices and how we were building in the studio. We hoped the research into the New Rural Studio two-year grad program and to partner with McGill also meant the experiments could potentially take place in parallel in very different climate zones. In the first project, Sal challenges to look at the design of mass timber panels as heat exchangers. The big picture was not only to be able to build with more mass timber products to help decarbonize the construction industry, but also the potential to eliminate insulation while simplifying the HVAC systems. Sal had done desktop experiments and already published a peer reviewed paper with John Grinham on the subject. The basic premise is that if you have a heat source in a space that instigates buoyancy ventilation and hot air rising, if you have apertures in the roof and lay down and low down in the wall, the hot air rises, escapes and is replaced lower down by cool air from the outside. We align this with the fact that heat will be lost through any wall. And to take advantage of these phenomena, Sal proposed to capture that heat loss with channels of external air that are, that are appropriately positioned and sized to capture that heat loss through the wall as the cool air is drawn in through the channels. The optimal Goldilocks scenario is illustrated in the center illustration. It's a balancing act of size of hole, thickness of wall, and position of the holes in relation to each other. It doesn't work if, for example, the wall is too thick and the channel diameter is too small. Increased friction means reduced airflow and inefficient heat transfer. To drive this buoyancy ventilation machine, you can use any kind of heat source in the space. In our test condition, we built a thermally active electrical surface mounted to the wall to be able to exactly quantify the heat supply and to be precise about its physical relationship to the timber wall. With the goal of scaling up the experiment to building scale, we strategize a series of intermediary, intermediary test steps and the students worked on two tracks, one testing at small scale, the other the design track for testing at building scale. In the test track, we started by replicating the original test boxes to confirm the science and at the same time worked to understand the thermal conductivity of the local yellow pine we intended to use. We found it odd that despite the proliferation and importance of Southern yellow pine in the construction industry, that there was little scientific publication on its thermal capabilities. First, we tested the premise without using buoyancy ventilation, instead using a blower door fan to be able to precisely control the airflow. And then we applied sensors to the timber test panels, of course. Once proven, we moved into the chimney condition and tested it with buoyancy ventilation. Then we scaled up to a panel of thickness that we anticipated for our large scale build and did a larger human scale, fully insulated test, care, test cell with a scaled up breathing wall that would help us tune the system prior to the full scale building. This allowed us to validate ventilation levels and heat recovery. In the design track, the student team proposed building two side by side comparison test pods on our property that down the road could be inhabited by students. One is a simple mass timber test building, the other with removable walls to test different breathing wall configurations. The pods were lifted off the ground for access to all sides, with the thought that down the road we may need to add exterior insulation. The team evolved an architectural language for the parts of the building that were not included in the science experiment, this, is inclu this included a big metal umbrella roof to ensure full and equal shade and rain protection and metal entry walkways and building penetrations. They tested different ways of lamination to ensure tightness. 
Full spreader plates and threaded rod proved the most successful. They also tested constructability with vertical and horizontal laminations. Of course, stacking, gravity, and self-weight won the day. So here are the pods today, ready for testing the full-scale breathing walls that will come in the future. A few weeks ago, a peer-reviewed paper was published on the subject, a first for the Royal Studio in the collaboration, and one of our graduate team has started a PhD with McGill to continue this specific work. To finish, the last adventure I'll show you today is the Thermal Mass and Buoyancy Ventilation Research Project that aims to validate scaling rules for thermal mass design while showing that wood can perform as well as more traditional thermal mass materials. When properly validated, the scaling rules may provide a powerful shortcut for thermal mass design in climate resilient buildings. The mathematical scaling rules are inspired by new research into termite mounds and the way their mounds and the way their mounds use internal thermal mass for temperature regulation as well as ventilation. During the day, the heat from the interior air is transfer transferred to the thermal mass, cooling the air and causing the air to fall. At night, the thermal mass warm throughout the day transfers heat to the interior air, which then rises, creating buoyancy ventilation convection cycles. These temperature cycles can be predicted and designed with an app developed and published by Sal and the McGill's research team. The app allows you to manipulate the proportions of the thermal mass and building with inputs of height of the space, desired ventilation rate, temperature damping, and internal heat load. The app gives ranges for the size of the thermal mass with thickness and surface area to mint the desired performance parameters. Any material could be input into the app as long as you have its specific heat capacity and thermal conductivity. The mathematical scaling rules optimize thermal mass thickness and surface area using mechanical material property data to target a free running temperature and buoyancy ventilation rate. The app was used to design small test box experiments with the goal of validating the scaling rules while also comparing two thermal mass materials, wood and concrete. Like the termite mounds, the test boxes use thermal mass to synchronize natural thermal storage and convection cycles. Data from the test boxes has been recorded and analyzed and has, been, and has given very positive results. The temperature swing in the test boxes is more regular than the outside air and ventilation is being produced in both the updraft and downdraft condition. Both the wood and the concrete test boxes produced a temperature damping of close to 80%, which equates to around a seven degree Fahrenheit temperature change. The design buoyancy ventilation rate is 0.05 liters a second. Because of the difference in thermal properties, the wood test box produced slightly less ventilation, whereas the concrete performed closer to expected. With a slight increase in the surface area, wood could achieve the same ventilation rate. These small scale test box experiments have validated the scaling rules and now two larger inhabitable structures are being built to test performance at the building scale. These will provide spaces for testing and living as well as demonstrating the effects of buoyancy ventilation in the cooling porch below. And we started building them last week. So we were pouring concrete. So just to close, um, to say working with McGill has been an extraordinary learning curve, quite a shock to our system. The scientific rigor has changed the game and brought a new discourse to the studio. It's challenged us to think about how to review and critique the work, to reflect on the way we do the work, how to learn from it and how to measure the things we have made. It's made me believe architects need to take a position and not be passive consumers to dare to be producers and contributors of knowledge to the global discourse. Sorry for reading all of that. Thank you. I guess it's your turn, Jan. Yeah, so thank you, Chris, for inviting me and thank you for putting together this pretty interesting panel, I have to say. 
uh, somehow all address, all three of us are addressing the same issue, how to use uh, the properties of timber for novel systems, architectural expressions beyond standard typologies, but we approaching this topic from very different angles, I would say. I start my, I start my presentation with a few slides that probably most of you have seen already plenty of times, but I think they're important to frame somehow the context. On the left side, you see, as you all know, that the building sector is one of the main consumers of fossil resources and one of the main emittents of carbon dioxide. So if we want to contribute as architects and engineers to the fight of, against climate change, we have to drastically reduce, uh, reduce our carbon dioxide emissions. On the right side, you see on the other hand, that at the same time, we have to drastically increase our building activities. So the yellow bars, this is the existing building floor area today, we have today and the blue bars are the buildings that we need to build within the next decades for the growing world population. And this enormous need for new buildings does not only hold for Africa or China, it also holds for North America and Europe due to, due to a demographic change and due to migration. So at the same time, we have to build much more buildings and reduce our uh, consumption of resources. So as an engineer, I would say these are somehow diverging optimization goals. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the next slide, again, information that you all know, we, the, the, the production of cement and of steel, both, are correlated with, with a lot of carbon dioxide emissions. So every new building that is made out of steel or concrete, even if it's smart and light, and material appropriate and load adapted, every new building of steel and cement is bad for the climate. Yeah. And the only way to turn this around is to make use of this dark blue block that you can see here, which is the carbon storage potential of wood. Yeah, we all know that one cubic meter of wood stores around about one ton of carbon. And if you want to address this challenge of building more with less, we can only do this by drastically increasing the use of wood in the building sector. What you can see here, uh, here's another graph that I like pretty much that I found recently, recently in literature. You can see here that over millions and millions of years, we build up a kind of carbon storage pool, terrestrial carbon storage pool in the form of coal, gas, and oil and reduce the, the amount of the percentage of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And with the beginning of the industrial revolution uh, at the end of the 18th century, we exploited the, these, these resources and transformed them to cement and steel for our buildings. And at the same time, increased uh, the carbon dioxide um, concentration in our atmosphere. And the only way to turn this around is to consider our buildings as a storage uh, for carbon, and by this reducing the uh, reducing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But at the same time, if you look at the timber buildings that have been built in the last decade, this is more or less a random selection of timber structures in North America and Europe from the last 10 years. You can see two things. First, timber proved to be a suitable building materials for a large and high and also fire resistant structure. But second, they all show the same typology of small and regular grids, and also of a lot of steel inlays and uh, concrete cores and concrete slabs. So the architectural potential or the design space from perspective of, uh, uh, of architectural expressions or structural systems is still far below the one of, tim of uh, steel or concrete structures. And this is somehow the topic that we are addressing. We want to explore how we can use timber for uh, more, uh, more for a larger variety of systems that go beyond this box-like typologies that are typically used in the in the uh, in timber architecture. And this is only possible by looking. And this is also what 
uh, the two other speakers have done, looking at fabrication and assembly processes in parallel to design methods. And we call this co-design, kind of mutual feedback oriented, oriented development of fabrication assembly processes and design methods that then lead to new building systems. And I'll show you three projects. First one from 2014. Uh, so it's the same time that uh, from Sachs, uh, Sachs uh, Trust Structure, around about the same time. Uh, this was uh, the, the shell in, in uh, Schwäbisch Gmünd. All the projects I'm showing, I'm showing are joint endeavors. I have to say this from Achim Menges and my group. Yeah? And at that time, we built this uh, shell structure in Schwäbisch Gmünd. Gmünd. And uh, it's a kind of small, uh, small um, structure, 11 meter span in one direction, 17 meters in the other direction. And the, the question was, how can we build a load adapted, doubly curved sh shell out of planar elements? And in this, how can we develop a cost effective uh, system for shell structures? What we did at that time is we installed the uh, robot in the shop of a small family owned um, uh, timber manufacturer close to Stuttgart. And uh, I think the, the, we all know that uh, computer controlled um, fabrication processes are uh, existing since 20 years, but they usually the machines are optimized for one fabrication step, for example, for cutting beams. Yeah? And the robot is a kind of generic tool that allows different fabrication processes and is also open for future adaptions for future innovations. These are also beach, beach uh, LVL elements, as I think Zach has, saw, has uh, talked about this also. Uh, we know that uh, in the building sector, spruce, pine, and fir are typically used. And beach is not used as a building material because its tendency to, uh, to warp and uh, in the, but in the form of LVL, of laminated timber, it's kind of a stable plate that can be used for the structural system. So all the, uh, all the uh, steps that need accuracy and precision are uh, transferred to the shop and on site, only very simple assembly processes are needed. Putting of the screws and uh, placing of these timber panels and the forces are transferred by this zigzag finger joint connection here. And here you can see the load bearing system is what you see, the structure is what you see, the, the plates are only five centimeters thick. They could have been thinner from a structural perspective. We needed the five centimeters only to place the screws here. And on the outside, we have this uh, drainage layer and an outer cladding and a, a thin thermal insulation layer here. Um, the next step is then to transfer this single layer uh, struct shell structure to a double layer system. That's what we have done last year for the Buga Pavilion in Heilbronn. So here we don't have um, only one load bearing plate. We replace this one plate by this hollow, uh, hollow uh, segments. So top plate, the bottom plate and six edge beams to transfer the forces. So out of one component, we made eight that had to be fabricated. And the height, of course, can be adapted to the loading situation that we have here. Um, <clears throat> we can see here that by this, by this, we have three times the span from 11 meter to 30 meter with the same amount of wood, around about 36 uh, kg per square meter shell surface. This, uh, these uh, shell structures, I mean, I'm a structural engineer, as Chris said at the beginning, we all dream of this wonderful concrete shells that have been built at the mid of the uh, 20th century, not only by Heinz Isler, also by Candela um, and many others, Torocha and many others, but these building forms are, uh, disappeared, they disappeared from the scene because they are so expensive in fabrication um, that no one can uh, pay for that. And uh, the idea is to 
replace this continuous surface by planar segments and by this to, put, to create a kind of building system that is also competitive and cost efficient and that allows for doubly curved load adapted shell structures for uh, reasonable costs. Um, but of course, this is only possible if all these segments are um, if the geometry of all these segments is are um, adapted to the specific situation. That means they're, they're all different. Here you can see the computational model. Again, also what Zach said already, no drawing were made here, only kind of Rhino model was directly transferred to the fabrication. Here we had these two corresponding robots. Again, this kind of mobile platform that was not installed at university, it was installed at the shop of this uh, medium scale uh, fabricator Klaus Zuckert. The left one is placing, picking and positioning the components with his vacuum grippers. And the right one is processing them, is uh, applying the glue, applying the glue, as can, you can see this here, is then, uh, um, putting these temporary uh, nails, hardwood nails, to fix the components during hardening and yeah, applying the glue again. I think I have another video here, you can see it again. Here it, pla it place, places the glue, applies the glue, puts these edge beams, and then, um, and then uh, places these hardwood nails for temporary fixing of these edge beams, glue again, and finally, after curing of the curing of the glue, it mills this uh, zigzag joints at the end. You can see this one minute, one second. Here you can see that the same machine is is conducting all these different uh, steps of processing these components. And this is something that is really. I'm a structural engineer, really surprising. When, we, when you know these construction sites from the concrete shell, the, the cost, the money is in the formwork, yeah? in the formwork and the heavy formwork that you need to produce these concrete shells. And that's why no one can pay for them anymore. And this shell was produced without any scaffolding. Only the three edge beams were supported once. This is only possible because the components are very light and very stiff at the same time. And the, all these forces were transferred by contact between this, uh, these edge beams. And this was only possible due to the very high precision of prefabrication. Uh, 0 0.3 millimeters were the tolerance that we had here. You can see here, this is a final, the final component that was put in and everything fitted pretty well. We only needed here this, uh, these bolts to take the out of plane shear forces. And you could, can imagine that this was a pretty painful job, yeah, over overhead with uh, no limited visual, uh, visual control. So the next step is then to bring this computational methods also on site huh, from fabricate from the shop on site to facilitate and support uh, assembly. And this was the final shell and um, it was installed last year at the Federal Gardening Show in Heilbronn and there were day and night events and concerts and lectures because it also had pretty good acoustic properties due to this uh, hollow box as you can see. Uh, where, do, yeah, where do we see the uh, application scenarios for these type of structures? Wide spanning timber structures here on the left. Also extension of the existing building stock. We had now two, uh, two um, queries for, uh, for um, extension of parking lots because no one puts his car on the top level. Yeah. And we have less cars, less and less cars, even in Germany and Stuttgart. Uh, and, and this is a light structure and it can allows also for adaption to different geometric configuration. And third is also temporary structures because we can disassemble the structure again without affecting the load bearing system. Uh, but of course, a question that is always or frequently asked is, 
you are doing this crazy shaped shells, but what we actually need are regular slabs, multi building systems from multi-story buildings. Yeah? And but what we want to do now is we transfer these ideas and these concepts to slabs. As I said earlier, all these timber structures show small spans, typically five, six, seven meters, not more, and regular grids. And we want to develop now a building system that allows for larger spans and irregular grids, as you can do with uh, concrete slabs as well. And what, what you also want to do is you want to avoid all this steel joints, steel connectors by this hardwood inlays that you can see here that transfer the forces via contact. And we use the same fabrication setup, the same uh, robotic fabrication setup, and also this idea as for the Buga shell with this double layered uh, structure. So we try to, we see this pavilions and the shells as a demonstrator to explore the full geometric and structural potential of the system. But um, uh, of course, what we want to do is then is the next step to transfer them to, um, to the regular building applications. As a final uh, project here, this tower that we did also as an example for new building forms, new structural forms out of timber. Um, what we did here is we used this uh, curved elements to produce this tower. The geometry looks very complicated, but it is not so complicated actually, if you once understood it. It's a kind of ruled surface. You rotate one cylinder uh, around the other one, and that leads to these, uh, these uh, geometries. So the strips look doubly curved, but actually they're only single curved. Uh, you can see here that they are, they are cut out of cylinders. And um, what was done here, not by me, it was, it was more research by ETH actually, is that they used this um, potential, or this, this shrinking of wood to, um, to uh, create a stubbly curved surface. So these are two layers of wood. One is wet, one is dry. They are laminated in a zero 90 degree and one is shrinking and by this, you create this, these curved surfaces. In a certain sense, it's similar to what, again, to what Sack said earlier. So what you typically consider as a kind of, uh, how do you say, as a kind of drawback or, or how do you say this, how do you say this, a weak, weakness of wood, yeah? This potential of, of shrinking is somewhat turned to, to use it in a kind of uh, constructive and positive way. And the new thing here is the fact is very old and not new, but the new thing that was considered that was developed by the ETH Zurich is a method to control it that you can really with a high precision produce, um, produce uh, single curve components. Okay, you can see them. Here you can see that this was a 14 meter high tower. Also no steel inlays, no steel ring, no stiffening steel elements. If you were structural engineers in timber systems, you would know that many timber structures are steel structures cladded with wood elements. Yeah? And here you can see only the timber is carrying the load and the load bearing system, load bearing thickness is only nine centimeters on the inside. And uh, yeah, and again, we have here the load bearing the load bearing structure is nine centimeters. Then we have this water proof drainage layer, black foil, and on the outside, a kind of cladding to, to cover this black foil. And the timber here, timber tower here in the outskirts of Stuttgart. In the meantime, it's gray. Doesn't look like this anymore. I think this was my final slide. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you, um, Zach, Andrew, and Jan for presenting your work here this afternoon. It's you know, obviously very compelling in terms of where you guys started and now where you guys are currently at and thinking about what the future might hold uh, for the discipline of architecture's education. And I'm curious to know if you guys can take just one or two minutes here to uh, tell us about 
just a little bit about how you feel the evolution of your programs are working out. So in some ways you started from, I would say very, very, you know, simplistic beginnings and, and just answering some basic questions. And now all of a sudden we have nine centimeter wall thicknesses that are spanning enormous distances. We have breathing walls. We have complex uh, structures made from uh, interrogating the forest. That didn't start, you know, with the, the initial question. So maybe you guys can just take a little bit of time here and talk about the evolution of your programs. Absolutely. I mean, to, to start in, I mean, I think a bit to your point, Chris, the, the biggest one is simply that if we do hard things again and again, they become easy. And so I think kind of there's an interesting side, you know, it, it's, it's to the value of the project. But when we went to build the cabin that we showed, those methods had been developed and those students therefore were starting at stage six. And so I think the kind of piece that we've seen is that each year in this program for Design and Make, each year adds a skill set. And in part because the staff also presents a continuity, there's an ability to, I think, really accelerate that learning and to be able to cover pieces at a speed that typically we're not able to. Um, I think for us, the key also is the value is sending a bunch of individuals around the world after their studies to hopefully take these things there and to kind of, well, we dream of many hooks surrounding the world, but yeah. So I, I, could, have, I could have stressed this more in my presentation, uh, but in our case, we have this one year studio where we explore with students of architecture and also a few engineering students, new ideas. And I have to say that in our case, all the core, the key innovations, they always come out of this work with the students and uh, the, the teaching and the kind of open-ended exploration of ideas. And then when the idea is there, then we take it on and scale it and, uh, and use it for these structures. But for us, for Achim, as well as for me, uh, teaching is still a kind of means to create innovations actually because the students are not experts. I think that's, you know, I'm an, I'm an expert. An expert means you always have to kind of, uh, how do you say this in English? Coined brain already. Huh? And, uh, and, and, and uh, you always think in the same trajectories or you tend to think in the same trajectories. And students as non-experts, they always question this. They force you to question this. Uh, Chris, I, I, uh, I mean, I, 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 I hope in some respects answered it by what I talked about, but I think I think we do we we have the luxury and space of being able to build right, and sometimes that's the double-edged sword that that sort of building is the answer to to every problem. Um, what what I have appreciated over the last five years is that we are recognizing. The kind of the pretty large portfolio of work that we have and that getting getting into the data of the buildings that we've made and and understanding kind of post occupancy evaluation has become really important for us so um you know understanding the consequences of what we've made quite frankly instead of just making it and, and at some level solving a, a pro, one problem which might be housing somebody but but actually getting real data from that and i think again uh, over the last four or five years has changed the game for us i think the the, fr the difficulty for us honestly is, is is both it's again it's the double-edged sword it, it's it's sort of fun out here trying to imagine you know one of the challenges here we, we're we're trying to test the leakiness of breathing walls whilst at the same time being surrounded by leaky breathing walls. So we actually don't really have any climate control spaces <laughs> to do the research in. So uh, um, <laughs> it's that, that there's a kind of subtext to all of that that's actually kind of fun actually. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I think just, uh, 
Yeah, as I said, I mean, I think I think um, the folks that we've started to get involved with have really helped change the game out here and, and bring new expectations to the work that we're doing. And we rely on, given where we are, we rely on visitors. We have, we have a kind of cloistered environment here, but really rely on people to come in and throw grenades at us and help us move forward. So that was kind of... And my way of kind of introducing some of the questions that are coming from the audience, which is just kind of looking at where things started, where they're at now, where you think they're going. But one of the questions that came in was, uh, how might the next steps um, uh, for you guys be in proliferating these ideas and innovations uh, to the mainstream methods of making and practice? Now, it's not always your guys' um, your, your kind of role to make that happen, but I think you're probably at the forefront of seeing what's leaving your programs, what's going out into the world in terms of education, and then maybe being able to pick up on or make a, a kind of an analysis on what's the resulting condition of that kind of release of knowledge into the general kind of trades or working or uh, practices. I, I can start and try. I mean, I think the, the honest friend say it's hard the, the kind of the, the projects we're able to develop in this space are, are unique, are, are difficult to replicate and and are difficult to scale. But but I think probably, and, and it was interesting, I mean, I think sitting in Kilmo's presentation yesterday in particular, I think part of it is us all being much more direct and upfront about the stats. And so I think legislation that was actually based on reading true sustainability was based on measuring the actual impacts I think if we stopped questioning expenses, the pure consideration for these methods, that would do a lot of the change. Um, I think projects like Jan's pointed to at the end there, which then make that pivot as well and say, here's the experiment we've done and here's how we show it's relevant, is I think probably the obligation on us to start to make that next step on. Um, so I do see our role as kind of spurring others, but, but I think some of it needs to be just, some of it will be legislated, some of it will be brought and communicated and I do hope part of it is at least convincing people to fall in love with trees for more than their their sustainable benefit because I think as a as somebody who comes from I guess a woodworking background into architecture I would say for me trees sustainable value is a side benefit that was probably the last concern for me in being obsessed with trees it's a really convenient thing but there's more to love um, mm. for me I think uh, so. Our our aim, at least, is to work on ideas at least at the horizon, allow for scaling and transfer to the building sector. And I think for us, it's very. I think our main main idea is to make students of architecture and engineering understand that they also have to design the fabrication processes and not only produce drawings. Eh? Or, or calculations in case of engineers. You also have to, you as an architect have to design and adapt the fabrication processes. You cannot expect that some expert will come from somewhere and do it for you. You have to, to develop the concepts and then you find experts, you have to find experts that help you to make this real. But the idea has, has to come from architecture. Mm -hmm. I think this is what we want to, we hope that our students understand that they have to consider assembly and fabrication as well. Yeah, I, I don't have much to add to that, Chris, to be honest. Very good. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more technical questions that are trying to come in here that talk about uh, the kind of use of fabrication or robotics to kind of push along some of the ideas that you're working on. So, you know, the, uh, do you think the means of six axes robots, CNC, academic efforts and breathing walls uh, could be soon transitioned to practice or do they mostly belong to academic budgets? Now, I know, Andrew, you, you'd you made uh, reference before, you don't necessarily have all of that stuff floating around uh, where you're at now, um, but you're also, I think, balancing an interesting moment here where you're not also working on maybe uh, kind of astronomically large buzz budgets. I think you're also probably the other end of the spectrum. Right. So maybe you can help us understand from your perspective what, what this person's uh, looking for in terms of melding those two things together? Well, 
yeah, I, the it, it's interesting. Uh, three days ago, we had uh, a guy come out from the U.S. Forestry Service, and he brought a saw miser out here, and he goes he goes around the state of Alabama, and uh, tries to encourage smallholders to imagine. Uh, uh, managing their own forests with with a kind of mobile sawmill right and i i think um what one of the difficulties and, and uh, you know these these issues are kind of issues that we can't solve with architecture i mean we're we're um i i showed you the, the you know I, I made a statement about the the land in alabama being owned by folks that live here part of that at a legislative level is that um, when people, there's a thing called air property and when people die, uh, they give it, they might give that property to their six kids. And then when those six die, they give it to a further six. And so um, the one, one of the real issues for the timber industry actually in, in a place like Alabama is that those large uh, holdings of timber actually have been reduced to much smaller uh, and, and again, as you know, as architects and, and makers, there's not much influence that we can actually have in a, in a condition like that. So we, I mean, we have to be very careful, quite frankly. Um, and I, you know, we're in our houses that, that you know, our, our little humble, modest 20K houses, it's, they are deliberately stick frame, deliberately site built, because there, there's, we believe that, you know, not only in them bring, trying to bring money into the local economy, but also um, pe people relate to the fact that a house is built in place better than if it's just, you know, that it, than if it's brought in from somewhere else. So there's a, there's an emotion and a kind of um, collective memory that's important in, in an act like that, which should, you know, sort of beyond the kind of things that we can control, you know, but uh, I don't know that I made any sense at all. Uh, but, um. I think it's, uh, I think some of what you've talked about today was brought up in other uh, right. conversations about the, the nimbleness of our systems to be right. more flexible for uh, the needs of local uh, communities. So right. I think some of the, the bigger questions that the industry and actually the panel that was uh, in terms of logistics manufacturing need to start to answer is how enormous do those presses and uh, processes need to get before they run out of the ability to serve uh, what is most important here, which is probably uh, the people living and existing within some of these states within the wood basket. I think that's probably where a little bit of that is heading for us here in the Southeast, particularly you in Alabama. Yeah, well, I, 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 again, as I said, our our region has a history of being an extraction landscape, and it and it, but some in some respects in the future that's got to flip around, and it would be nice if there was more of a kind of a symbiotic relationship between the the, the rural and the urban than than the urban simply being seen as the place where you take from. So. Yeah. Um, I thought maybe Jan would get mad and throw something at the, the screen whenever he uh, heard the question stated, are these enormous academic budgets meant to just stay within academics or was all this stuff you know, gonna just exist there? Uh, what, you know, you guys are translating this stuff into usable or applicable um, uh, processes that can be adapted for, I think, maybe conventional usage. Uh, so maybe you can address that a little bit in terms of what your intentionalities are at the ITKE and ICE. Yeah, but this, uh, I think this is also, this changed also. I think uh, when uh, uh, the AA and we started 10 years ago with this robot thing, then it was very kind of, well, also ETH, then it was kind of very, very uh, advanced and also expensive tools but nowadays you can go on ebay and buy a robotic arm for less than, than a car for, for less than your used car so the, the money is not in the machine and also the intelligence is not in the machine the machine is in the kind of uh, in the brain of the students actually mm -hmm. and that's where the, that's where, where all the effort is and uh, and i think i also don't like this kind of of robot fetishism that is somehow some of our driving some of our students when they come into our studio. I think it's not about the robot itself. It's about somehow understanding that you have, as an architect have to somehow 
design what I said before have to have to have to have to design the fabrication and assembly process as well as your architectural conceptual uh, drawing. Uh, this has to be considered as one. I think it's not so much about the, about the robot, actually. Mm. What does Zach? Do you want to add anything to, to that, say. or do you good with where that ended? Yeah. I guess the only piece I wanted to pick up on, it was one that had come up in Jan's presentation, because I think it's one that's very easily missed, is that in a, like the reason we're using robots themselves is not because they're the best tool for any one of these jobs. That, that I think maybe the interesting thing that underlies this all is the robot is in the six axis arm, an incredible tool for trying new projects. But in almost every case, most likely there would be an as built tool to do that job eventually. So, so that I think kind of seeing it in that mix between the conventional machine and the robot would be to say, the robot gives us the flexibility to come in Tuesday and retool for Wednesday. Mm -hmm. It likely shouldn't be the tool that's seen. And so I think that fetishization is a really important point that they're very misused in many schools as right. much as they're well, they're well used. Yeah. I'm going to ask one last question, and I'm uh, I'm asking it for a specific reason. It's coming from the audience, and I, I think it's interesting to be it's posed to this particular group. Uh, there's a question here that says, "I'm curious about your positions on material resilience, uh, specifically over time and in the face of extreme weather events, uh, especially as climate change is impending uh, a th threat to our uh, built environments. Is technology-driven timber construction a feasible practice in our changing climate?" I don't know where you guys will stand on this idea of even thinking through resilience because it really only has come up in like kind of one moment, which has to do with maybe Jan's discussion about carbon uh, as, a, as a thought process here. But the rest of you guys are looking for something maybe different, but are you talking about the ideas of resiliency or uh, material resilience within your uh, local discussions with students or people that are wanting to know more about your programs uh, within the communities you're existing and working in? Absolutely. I, I mean, I think probably the simplest answer to that question is to say those hurricanes are going to be worse if we build with anything but timber. Um, and so certainly we'll need to figure out, you know, I think there's a reason a stick frame blows apart in a storm and it's because nails don't have any tensile strength. Um, but I, I think for me, it, it can't be, we can build strong wood buildings. And so I think certainly it needs to be a piece we engage with. Um, but it's hard to imagine that being the reason not to. I think yeah, I mean, yeah. our we're we're in a, um, I, I live in a place where there's thirty percent poverty rate. So and anything that uh, we build down here, I think I think the the first thing that we're thinking about is, is how resilient these structures will be. Um, when, we, when we evolved from the initial first houses that were very, very experimental, it became very clear that um, our students were actually running before they could walk. And I said, you know, we, we, our, 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 our student teams really need to understand the basics of stick frame before we can, you know, both, um, I, I, I don't want to patronize them or our clients with, with the strange and wonderful things that we were doing at the time. So for us, it became really necessary that, that uh, uh, we had a different view on it. It's also true to say that five, five, seven years in, our program became less experimental because we realized we were gonna stay in this place and, and be here. So what were the big challenges that we should face? And um, starting to think about the quality of house construction was, was one of the things that we actually took on. So our, our stick frame 20K front porch program is, is very much a response to that and, and resiliency is a huge part of that. But frankly, around here, there's resilience at le every level, you know, food insecurity, education, health, it's, it's all wrapped into one really complex mess that we're, we're the home and the house is only actually a small part of that. Um, 
Uh, Jan, do you want to say anything or do you feel- No, I think if we, if, we, if, we want to talk, if we talk about sustainable architecture, I think the most important thing is that you allow for a long lifespan. Huh? That is, I think, the most, uh, most important criteria for sustainability, no matter in which material you build. So this is always a kind of top target. And I think Andrew was showing in his presentation the timber buildings from the 19th century or 18th century. Right. So I think uh, it's pretty obvious that the timber can be used for very durable buildings. Well, this brings us to the end of this panel. Um, I want to thank you guys for sharing your afternoon and, and evening with us. Uh, Zach, Andrew, uh, Jan, the work is uh, extraordinary and hopefully is going to continue to make impacts into the communities that you uh, live and work in and uh, beyond. Um, so thank you from, um, from all of us here at the Blue Lab and we appreciate your, your time again for the efforts. Uh, for those that are leaving this particular panel, I'm gonna move to our next one. Um, we'll be starting that uh, at, it looks like uh, that's 315. And so we look forward to having you all there. Thank you again, guys, and we appreciate it. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks, Chris.